we are raised in the fear of God to give a word. Genesis chapter 48, the 48th chapter of Genesis. Joseph bringing his sons into the presence of his father for blessing. Verse 12, And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my father, my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, and the God which fed me, and the word here is, the God who was my shepherd, all my life long unto this day. Keeping that in mind, we'll read the greatest of all Psalms, the 23rd, Psalm 23, which I trust will be a message at the close that will be a help to all the Lord's people. So well known. Psalm 23 is a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me, or hath made me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters, waters of quietness. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely or only, all the days, only goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, the length of days, goes far beyond an earthly house, look forward to that heavenly home where the shepherd would greet the sheep. Now the Lord will bless to us the reading of this psalm. I have read this psalm all the days of my life. Since I was saved, it was precious to me on many occasions. I go back to us when I was six years old, as a child, I was to recite this psalm at the Sunday school uh, gathering for the giving of the prizes. And I quoted this psalm when I was six years old. I've loved this psalm all my life. It's been my privilege to read it at weddings, many weddings of people, some who were here. I read this psalm. I read it in days of darkness, when I entered houses where sorrow had come. I read it at burials, and I read it when sorrow entered my life, and when problems arose. This is a great psalm, the greatest that David ever wrote, the shepherd's psalm. When we come to the Bible, the Lord desires to present himself as the shepherd. And in this lovely psalm, we have the shepherd ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He is the great shepherd who rose from the dead the third day. God brought again from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the blood of the eternal covenant. And today in heaven, he lives at God's right hand. That's why shepherd ministry is so complete and so precious. We look forward to the day when he who is the chief shepherd shall appear in glory 
and throughout the days that are to come, he will lead his flock like a shepherd and take them by, liver, by rivers of living water. And God shall wipe away every kind of tear from their eyes. The shepherd ministry of the Lord Jesus. Now what I want to speak about, I read in Genesis 48, because the last verse of this psalm connects immediately with the words of Joseph and the words of Jacob. Joseph came with his two sons to be blessed of his father. And we have the two shepherds face to face. And we hear these lovely words of Jacob, the God who has been my shepherd all the days of my life. Bless the lad. Here is Jacob blind and his hands are crossed, guided by the shepherd. And as he looks back over his long life, he said, God has been my shepherd all the days of my life. Now that's why I read that in Genesis 48, because the last verse of our psalm, goodness and mercy shall follow me, and the word is, has followed me and will follow me all the days of my life. Jacob was looking back and thought of the shepherd care of God during his whole life. A panoramic view he said, God was my shepherd all the days of my life. And here is David at the end of his life. This is the last psalm he wrote, by the way. Some people imagine that this psalm was written as he tended the flock and so on. No, he's an old man at the end of his life. And as he looks back on his life, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And he ends up with these beautiful words, goodness and mercy has followed me. The word shall mean, means it, it has followed me already and will continue to follow me all the days of my life. So here is a man at the end of his life and he's looking back and he's giving us his life story. He's going back and he's picking out certain days in his life when he experienced the presence of the shepherd. That's how I'm going to use it today. Don't take it away from me. I know that few people may speak like this about it, but this is the way that it appeals to me. That is an old man, his last psalm that he wrote, and what beautiful psalms he did write. And he's looking back now, and he sees his whole life in panoramic view, the days of darkness, the days of difficulty, the days of joy. And he said there was one that never changed, the shepherd, all the days of my life. So I want to speak then of some great days in David's life when he enjoyed the presence of the shepherd and to apply it to us because our life as sheep and our life as those who belong to him has dark days and sad days, days of triumph and days of delight and we wonder at times how he leads me. Jesus as a shepherd leads us and we wonder why did he lead me this way? And as we look back we can say, Jehovah the shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I go to this funeral tomorrow uh, to speak at it, I'm going to speak from this psalm because in the Globe and Mail, the announcement of the home call of our brother, the whole of Psalm 23 was put in the Globe and Mail uh, on Saturday night for the whole world to read. Because this psalm was a favorite psalm of our friend and brother who is now with Christ, which is far better. And I spoke to him about this psalm uh, before and mentioned to him this thought of all the days of our life, how the Lord would be with us. Let us think of some of the days of David's life corresponding perhaps to days in our life. Because as Christians, we all have days of joy and sorrow until we meet him. But the great thing is this, when we meet the shepherd, our days of toiling and mistakes and difficulties and problems, they will be over forever. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Consummation of the psalm. But let's think of the first day. Jehovah my shepherd. This is the day of his conversion. David was saved when he was very young. Likely 
as he tended the flock, he would think about God. I know from Psalm 8, he thought about the greatness of God. As he looked into the heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. As he sat with the sheep, watching them by night, and in the morning he saw the sun arising, that we have in the 19th Psalm, going forth. And as he looked at creation, he thought of one, the shepherd who controlled everything. And I believe that David looked forward for these Old Testament saints. They were saved by looking forward to the coming of the shepherd who would die upon the cross. We can't read some of David's Psalms without seeing that he saw in anticipation the sufferings of the shepherd who would bleed and die for guilty sinners. And so he had a day of conversion all the days of my life. I hope everyone here is a day of conversion. The day when we knelt wherever we were owning our guilt. The day when we climbed out of bed to kneel before our God confessing our sin. I go back a long time to the day when I bent my, bent my stubborn knees before the God that I had rejected and owned my sin in his sight. I remember it. It's a long time ago. When I knew the shepherd first, the Lord is my shepherd. Is there one without him? You would leave this great conference where we've heard the voice of God so often without the shepherd. And go home from the conference knowing not Christ as your Savior. The beginning of Christ Christian living begins at the cross, begins at Calvary, to see that that one that I've heard so much about in this conference, hanging on that cruel tree, he was there in the room instead of guilty sinners. And I might as well tell you, I'm one of those, I'm a firm believer with all my heart, that the word world in John 3 and 16 is the world of lost men. And not one has been left out of that provision. God so loved the world, the world of the perishing, that he gave his only begotten son. One privilege I had in South Africa was to speak to 800 students in high school, the sec my second visit, after Mandela came and gave them high school teaching, and they had uniforms, and I was invited there to that place and they were all worshippers of the tree god and worship of the animal, the headmaster, all the staff but one knew nothing about Christ. But one man in that place was a Christian. He was in the assembly. And he said to the master, he said, there's a Canadian in the city having meetings. He said, I've never met a Canadian. I'm glad he didn't tell him I was an Irishman. He said, but I am a Canadian citizen. And he said, as a Canadian, I'd like to meet a Canadian, he said. Great country. I've read of it. And so he invited me along. And when we talked, he arranged that I could come to that high school and speak to those young people, 800 of them in number. And I had the great privilege on a lovely morning overlooking the Indian Ocean, beautiful morning at 7 o'clock. And they all arrived, you know, Echoes of Service magazine. It was, a picture was taken of me preaching to those children. The first time they ever heard John 3.16 in their life. And it was published in Echoes of Service and went throughout the world. And I have one of those hanging in my study. And I often look at it, all those colored people dressed in vestures that they had never known before and in a high school and all their teachers there and I'm given the privilege of opening the book and I took a little testament and I read I said is there anybody here has ever heard this verse from the Bible there's only one child the child of that Christian teacher raised her little hand not one of them ever heard it in their life well I said boys and girls first thing I would like to do is to teach you this great verse. I'm glad I didn't have the New King James Version or any of those versions. 
And I might as well confess to you, I'm a King James Version man, not a new King James Version man, or a, some other uh, play, because the sweetness is lost in the text. Sweetness. I have read all the versions in John 3.16 is a muddle. People won't like me saying that. I don't want to be hurtful at, at preaching on the shepherd. But I was glad I believed in the King James Version for the heathen. And I, I read it, and I said, now repeat it after me. And they did. I said, say it louder. There are angels watching us. They are holy beings between us and the Son and the Father, God, watching us this morning, this lovely morning. And they, they might be a little dull of hearing. Say it louder. And so we learned that. And then I stopped and I said, now say it yourself. I know I saw a man standing beside me, a missionary, and he drew his handkerchief as that great audience, like the waves of the sea, pulled at this lovely verse, for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have forever eternal life. What a verse. What a Savior. Nicodemus believed it the first time he heard it. Greatest verse in the Bible. Listen, there's something in that verse that's nowhere else in the Bible. You read from Genesis 1 to John 3.15, you'll never find it. Read from verse 17 to 22.21 Revelation, you'll never find it. There's something in that verse that is unique, stands out like the Tower of Pisa, like some great building that cannot be copied. There's something in that verse that's nowhere else in the Bible. You say, what is it? I'll not ask you. You wouldn't know. It's the only verse that tells me that God loved the world. The uniqueness of the verse stands in its singularity and the fact that nowhere else in the Bible do we read that God loves the world only here. Blessed verse. If you're going to preach the gospel, I have to go and preach the gospel in a few minutes. I think I'll preach John 3.16. It's always great. You know, a brother said to me when I was preaching with him, he says, Harold, I'm stuck. I said, preach John 3.16 when you're stuck. Every night he was stuck. I told him, preach the same thing. How can you preach it over and over again? Just repeat it. God loved the world. And fill it up. Fill it up. And God will use it. More souls will be in heaven through that verse than any others. When we get to the glory, multitudes of us here gain assurance from it. We love it. I hang it up at the entrance to my home. Always, every house I've been in, I hang it up. Not outside, but above the hallway. Well, the first person comes in, he's a Greek, he's coming to fix a light, he's coming to see. My wife says, this oven's not working. Bring him in, and he stops and he looks. And he looks at it. Great verse. Say nothing until they say to you. You never speak to him. No, never speak to him. Let him stand and gaze at it. And then as he turns away, he says, interesting. Oh, I said, very interesting. More interesting than the old machine you're going to fix. And there... Greatest thing in the world. Really, he said. Yeah, great thing. How you tell it? How you tell it? Maybe he's an Italian or something. I speak all the languages in the whole world. Speak Chinese even when they come. Yum, 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 yum. Big, big verse. Yeah. Tell, you, tell you about God in heaven. Go there. Yeah, yeah. You want to go? See? Tell him. Story of a cross. Great verse. The Lord is my shepherd. That's where we begin. The cross. All of us look back who are saved here and we say that's the great day, the first day in David's experience. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. What a lovely verse that is. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Not only was the Lord his shepherd on that day, but the Lord became his shepherd on another day. One day when he was tending the flock, the flock was assailed by two wild beasts, a lion and a bear. And he tells the great king, he tells 
the great man that he's going to meet the giant, not afraid to meet the giant, he tells Saul, he said, an enemy came to the flock, took a lamb, a kid of the flock, and he said, I went after that beast, and I delivered that beast out of the mouth of the lion. I took the lamb out of the mouth of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. What happened? The animals pounced on him, and he now found himself in the same situation as the lamb was. He himself found himself in the same situation as the lamb he had delivered. I was the shepherd to that lamb, but not only was I the shepherd to the lamb, but he said to the king, he said, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the bear and out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord was my shepherd. He delivered me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He knew the shepherd experimentally, not only as his savior from going down to the pit, but he knew the shepherd ministry of the Lord when he was in difficulties with the enemies. And the enemy, the bear with his flattery, and the lion activity of Satan, the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Peter found deliverance too out of the paw of the bear and out of the mouth of the lion. So he had a day of deliverance, not only from sin, saved for eternity, but along the way. Oh, thank God, he is able to save to the end all that come unto God by him. We too, sometimes, Satan so distresses us that we feel the paw of the lion. We feel the danger of the hug of the bear of the world and we need the shepherd ministry of Christ. So here was a second day, a day when he was delivered. Verse three, he restoreth my soul. This is a sad day. It's a day that should concern each of us here, that we're not home yet. We'll never be safe from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. We'll never be saved from moral catastrophe will never be saved from the power of sin until we're at home safe at last you know what my prayer is for myself for my brethren for my sisters for all the children of God that we might pray together preserve me O God for in thee do I put my trust we were singing a hymn the other day it touched me it is only in thee hiding I know my life's secure. Only in the abiding I steadfast shall endure. As we look out into the world, and as I look back on my long experience among the Lord's people, there are dear men I've preached with. They lost their way. There are men that when they preached, you could feel the weight of their ministry. They lost their testimony. There are many that once sat around the supper as we did today. We never thought it would ever befall them. They're gone. Back into the world. May I have approached men that I knew and that prayed and that were touched and that loved the assembly. And they got sidetracked in various ways. The Lord is my shepherd. He restoreth my soul. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Then shall I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted to thee. If we're away in heart from the Lord, we don't get blessing in our lives. If an assembly is simply playing church, and if we get to the place where we're just attenders, we're not exercised. And finally Satan traps us. The world, the flesh and the devil is an unchanging foe. And here we have a man that looks back and sees the fall he had. But he said, he restoreth my soul. 
Thank God David was restored. But he never forgot the sadness of being away and the tragedy that befell him. And likely it haunted his memory long after he was restored. How could I ever have done such a thing as that? Oh, may the Lord help us that we might know the preserving of the shepherd and restoration. Now listen to these words. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You couldn't read that without thinking of the valley of Ella. You couldn't help thinking of the shadow of death. You're coming to me. I'll give your flesh to the birds. Goliath's challenge in the valley of Ella. And David comes with five smooth stones he has taken from the brook. I had a little uh, quiz one time in a, an assembly. They asked me to speak to the children because all the preachers uh, were busy. And they said, could you speak to children? I said, fine, I'll speak to the children. So I began with a little riddle. It's in the water, it's in the air, it's in the busy brain. Five there were like unto me will ne'er be seen again. And I asked the question. And the preachers began to go out one by one, convicted in their conscience. <laughs> and they, they, all everybody was, didn't know what to say about it. Simple. You have the answer now because I'm reading the passage. It's in the water. It's in the air. It's in the busy brain. For there were like unto me will ne'er be seen again. The five stones. But I know when I came home, I was staying with a, a, a very prominent man in the educational world. He was a headmaster in a school. I was staying with him. In the middle of the night, he knocked the door. He says, Harold, I can't sleep. I thought he can't sleep because he says, I don't know what's in the water and in the air and in the busy brain. Can't sleep. I said, Ask the teachers tomorrow. I let him go. I know whether he slept on me. But you see, it was a little quiz. But it was a true quiz. And here's this lovely Sam. He's going down in the eyes of the king. How could that stripling come with five smooth stones? The reason he took five, by the way, was Goliath had four brothers. He says, if they all come out, I'll kill them all. Take the five. So he took five stones. They didn't come when they saw the way he could handle a sling. No. And of course, people say that the only part of the giant that was, uh, the place was bare of his head. It's a lot of nonsense. That giant that I explored for my own understanding, that the helmet of the Philistine covered his brow. But that stone went with such velocity and such power that it ripped through the metal and into his head. And it was guided by God. But David took a careful aim, but that stone could never go astray. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I am come in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. This is the day of victory, the day of power. You know, he's just an ordinary man. We're only ordinary people. Servants that rise here are just ordinary men, failing men. But if God uses us, we can become a power to the enemy. We may become like other men and lose our, like Samson. He lost his ability, lost his power. He went out as at other times, but the people could see he hadn't got it. The men that I used to listen to that would have moved you. And God was with them. But something happened to them. Either they got proud or they got haughty or they got feeling they were the boss of everything. They weren't the same. They weren't the same. You know, when it comes to preaching, charisma's not it. Education's not it. Reams of notes is not it. Without him, we can do nothing. I've understood that when I'm getting older. You know, when you're younger and vitality and 
memory clear. When you get older, you don't rise so quickly. You're not as buoyant. My wife says I'm more buoyant than ever I was. But no matter, we rise up in the fear of God. That God helps me. If God helps a man to preach, if God helps a man to bring the gospel, it's not a matter of shouting hell and telling fearful stories. It's a matter of getting to the hearts of people, letting them see their ruin, their condition, and that one has loved us. The love of God. No sinner can ever turn away from that love once he's awakened. The love that Jesus had for me to suffer on the cruel tree. I ransom soul might be it's more than tongue can tell. David went that day and God was with him. What a day that was. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the day when God helped me, and the rod and the staff, they helped me along the way. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. When did that happen? David, you know, had sad days in his life. One of the saddest days, our brother referred to the tears of, Mount Mar of, Ma of the mountain, Mount of Olives. The first man to shed tears in the Bible on the Mount of Olives was David. He crossed the brook Kedron that the Lord would pass later. But he was fleeing from a disobedient son. In the case of the Lord, he was going up in obedience to the Father across the brook. And as David went up, he wept as he went up. The Bible says that the people that were with him wept. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the slopes of all of it, the Savior wept alone and shed great sweat drops of blood in the Garden that we might finally be saved. Oh, what love. They all forsook him and fled. As David went up, fleeing from a rebellious son, the Mount of Olives. And he who was the king lay on the backside of the desert. There appeared before him men. One of them was Barzillaiah and others. And they came with bunches of grapes. They came with raisins. They came with honey and bread. And they spread a table before him in the wilderness. He says, that was a great day. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. This is what it's all about. The day when God spread a table on the hillside of Moriah for the king. But the Savior on the mountainside, there was no one came to give him to drink. There was no one came to share his grief. They all forsook him and fled. And we see him lying. Matthew, the gospel of the king, always touches me. In the garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't like in Luke where he kneeled down. But the king was on his face. He lays full length in the garden. With his precious head to the swords of earth. For me was it was in the garden. That he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be that Savior went all the way. And in this case was a day when he knew the presence of God and a table spread before him in the garden. My cup runneth over. And then we read these lovely words. Only goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. Think of it. As David looked back, he said, All the days of my life, the sheep dogs of old followed. These are two dogs. Goodness and mercy. Following the sheep. These guardians, they followed me all the days of my life. He's going into the presence of God. David's a lovely character, one of the greatest. I'm glad that my friend David here was called David. That's you, David. What a lovely name that is. I preached to David when he was a little boy of 12, long ago. David, 
What a beautiful name. The son of David is my savior. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He wanted to build a house for God. He wept when he wasn't allowed to build it. Nathan came and said, you can't build the house. Your son's going to build the house. But you know what he said? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The presence of God. An earthly house. I believe David looked far beyond an earthly house. He looked to the heavenly home. Dear brethren and sisters, one of the sweetest hymns we sing is this. I have a home above. From sin and sorrow free. A mansion. Eternal love prepared. Designed for me. And when life is over, if it be tonight he comes, he'll conduct us to the Father's house. But if any of us should pass suddenly away, we have a home above. Jehovah is my shepherd. May the Lord bless his word.